be sure to order your copy of Untethered, Living and Leading Liberation at edleadershipforliberation.com. That's E-D, leadership, the number four, liberation.com. You can click on the book release and for liberation merchandise link and get your pre-sale order of the book today. Thank you. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting all by, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me, yeah, and I'm feeling good. Innovation often comes from necessity. Most of us walk through life merely trying to survive and abandon the expectation that life is meant for us to create conditions that help us thrive. We try to keep on rose-colored glasses for as long as possible, but the inescapable harsh realities of life often blur those glasses well earlier than we are ready for, and our fight for constant survival begins. When was it that you shifted into survival mode? When did you stop trusting in the people and things around you and begin to cling to an emerging self-reliance or deeper faith rooted in your relationship with God, your ancestors, or the universe? Interesting enough, life can sometimes even make you wonder if you can even trust yourself. Now, humor yourself for a moment. Think about the most recent instance in which you knew better, but chose not to do better. Your moment might very well have been years ago, but for some of us who are truly a work in progress, your moment could well have been minutes ago. Those instances might range from extreme to minuscule, but all the same, they are moments when we are not our best selves. They are moments when we like to challenge our inner voice and the world around us in a defiant manner because we think the risk far outweighs the reward. Since we are ready to continue to tear off proverbial band-aids together, I willingly accept this vulnerable moment and recall one of the earlier times in my life when I started to put on the cloak of survival as life started to clip the petals from my rose-colored glasses. Little did I know those same rose petals and their roots would forge their way through cemented ambitions and concrete thoughts of discontentment for decades to come. I learned early on that growing up poor often creates a cavity of constant want and yearning inside. It's inside of you and holds the way you interpret the world hostage because you find yourself running away from any circumstance in life that might return you back to that state of lack. I grew up in Brockport, New York in an apartment complex called Viking Way. Upon entering into the complex, you immediately would see the dirt brown multi-story buildings and kids peppered around the playground in the midst of a double Dutch challenge, a game of hide and go seek or sandbox wars. I must admit that despite being poor, I had a fun childhood. 
Like many 80s babies, our existence was centered on playing outside from sunup to sundown. Asha, my older sister, who always served as my protector, she and I left the apartment before 9 a.m. And somehow the bowl of Captain Crunch cereal mixed with milk and water in hopes of stretching the milk until mom could afford to go grocery shopping again. It sustained us long enough to return home when it started to get dark. The meager accommodations of Viking Way, which became home for many immigrants and college students, were what some would call low-income housing. However, to us, they were a child's dream. The neighborhood was surrounded by canopied woods, bountiful dirt hills whose slopes served as our summer break water slides in the absence of having enough money to venture to the water park. The grounds of Viking Way became our ultimate Six Flags theme park or King's Dominion adventure. What we lacked in monetary riches, Viking Way made up for it in priceless childhood amusement. On any given day, I would relentlessly beg someone to borrow their boombox, the source of titillated joy for any 80s baby, and spend hours making up dances with my best friend, Lashana, who till this day has spun friendship and sisterhood into a lyrical web of the perfect ride-or-die anthem for our close bond. Lashana and I would gyrate to the percussions of Lisa Lisa cult jams, Wonder if I take you home. Oh, and I can't forget Paula Abdul's straight up now tell me until beads of sweat became drenched odors of outdoor pursuits. When we grew tired of dancing holes in our shoes along the sidewalk, we would often walk to the neighboring college campus where my mother was doing a different type of dance. You see, my mother taught African dance at SUNY Brockport College in upstate New York, and so the campus became somewhat of a second home to all of us. We felt celebrity status affiliation to be able to say that we knew the Edna Mensa and proudly let mommy roll off our tongues like treasured dice toppled onto a Russian roulette table. In fact, various Ghanaian professors like Dr. Okansi and Dr. Okoye also welcomed us whenever we frequented the campus. The African community at both the college and surrounding area was our safe haven, affirming our chocolate brown skin, our parents with thick accents, and the unique aromas of our foods that filled the apartment hallways all across Brockport. Now, to avoid your possible current wonderings about, I thought she said she was poor. Her mother worked at a college? You have to better understand the context of which it came to be that my kente cloth Ghanaian mother, with a billowing yet majestic accent that poured over her lips like sap from an African palm tree, came to be a dance instructor at SUNY Brockport College in upstate New York during the 70s. Before I share her story, I have to begin with the caveat that my mother is truly my favorite person in the entire world. I am a mama's girl through and through. My mother, Edna Mensa, is the gift my ancestors wrapped perfectly for my siblings and I, knowing that her untamed humor and her relentless optimism would fill our lives like potpourri designed to hide what truly laid beneath her struggle to actualize the American dream. My mother is the epitome of love. And as Maya Angelou said in her treasure trove tenor of a voice, I am grateful to have been loved and to be loved now and to be able to love because that liberates. Love liberates it doesn't just hold. That's ego. Love liberates. We didn't know that we were poor because our mother loved us so deeply that the joy she brought was as palatable as the large pot of Ghanaian peanut butter soup that would sit atop the stove of our small Viking Way kitchen 
for days as the only source of nourishment, when what we really wanted on our palates was a full course American meal, like meatloaf and mashed potatoes. It's funny because until this day, any time I make meatloaf, I chuckle, remembering back to being a child and seeing now what I know to be such a basic cost-effective American meal Meatloaf was the dinner centerpiece that 80s sitcoms like Punky Brewster, Full House, and Give Me a Break made episode after episode. I watched these sitcoms entranced by what I thought it meant to live in American life as I glanced at our stovetop filled with anguish over yet another pot of peanut butter soup. Oddly enough, I now delight in the experience I get cooking and eating authentic Ghanaian food, having now liberated myself from the American societal ideals of what being American actually means. Truth be told, the Edna Mensa did not make it easy for us to subdue our African roots, whether it was from the time she appeared at our school for a holiday chorus concert in full traditional African attire from head to toe or even the countless times when I was having a sleepover and she brought my friends and I our refreshments perfectly balanced on a tray on top of her head as she danced to herself, beatboxing African drums, leaving my friends in utter shock at the seemingly circus-infused mother they saw before them. I appreciate my Spenceport Elementary School Girl Squad at the time staying composed during all of those sleepovers to never make me feel ashamed of my mother, but also committed enough to resounding laughter to affirm my mother's efforts to entertain us. My bestie, Charmaine, with her almond-colored Latina skin, would lean back in her neon tie-dyed shirt, laughing under her breath, while my other bestie, Amy's freckled face, would light up as she jumped up to dance alongside my mother. And now, my eternal angel, Melissa, Her and I would collapse onto our nearby furniture, be it my twin bed or our velvet snake-shaped couch, with resounding hysterical laughter. Even at that early age, we knew my mother was a force. I've never believed in luck. Instead, I feel that God orchestrates all things according to your purpose and that it is our job to be prepared and open to walking in that purpose. That is the essence of liberation. My mother tells the story of how she danced into her purpose from being selected in a dance audition at a local university in Ghana in the 60s. First being turned away because she did not own any dance shoes, but her unparalleled talent convinced the international judges that the melodic antelope leaps and the syncopated tribal stomps of the orphan dancer before them was exactly what the dance program at SUNY Brockwork College in upstate New York needed. With very few belongings, my mother boarded the plane for the United States, forever changing the trajectory of our family and her legacy. Now, as a mother myself, I realize that the love and joy that my mother raised us with as children was seasoned with a deeper knowing of the sacrifices of your past that serve as constant reminders of what could have been and the hope for unprecedented favor and potential for the future. Earlier in this chapter, I asked you to think of a moment in your life that signaled an awareness of living life in survival mode. One of my moments was when we moved to Spenceport, New York, away from the Brockport African dance community that seemed to buoy us. I was immediately catapulted into a pool of internal conflict and tension that I felt ill-equipped to exist in, the Spenceport School District. The aforementioned Charmaine, Amy, and Melissa, let's not forget one of the brightest constellations in my universe, Lashana, were all my saving grace during my initial years in spent support. My cloak of survival adorned me on most days in those early spent support years, 
existing around peers whose lives mirrored what I had seen on sitcoms so many nights in Brockport as I reluctantly swallowed mom's peanut butter soup concoction for the week. These were the years when my lifelong question that would, and still, continues to haunt my current rose petals at every crack in life's concrete surfaces today. The questions, do I belong here? And most importantly, do I deserve to be here? Those questions would prove to challenge the sunlet that my rose from concrete needed throughout my journey toward liberation. I acquired beautiful friendships and countless memories during my journey in Spenceport. But I also gained a distinct awareness of my blackness and how it was perceived by others. Teachers and staff made numerous comments to me that I could not fully grapple with at the time and thus subsequently formed the thorns of my rose petals. In elementary school, I recall Mrs. R. pulling me aside when I got in trouble at recess to say, Leslie, you are starting to act more and more like them, pointing her pale, vein-strewn fingers to several African-American students. She continued, I thought that you were different, but if you're going to act like that kind, I won't choose you to read to the kindergarten classes anymore. I remember being confused as she scolded me because up until that moment, Mrs. R. had been one of my favorite teachers. She often called on me when I raised my hand in class. She always let me help grade my peers' assignments. However, in that moment, I realized that the privileged treatment that I had experienced from Mrs. R. was because she wanted me to be different from the stereotypes that she had constructed of many of the other students who looked like me. Comments such as this became progressively worse from other teachers throughout high school. To make matters worse, these comments were accessorized by instances of judgmental inquiries from some of the parents of white students with whom I had befriended. That's your mother? The one with a towel on her head? I was too embarrassed to explain that it was African cloth adorned as a head wrap like the crown of Queen Nefertiti. Instead, I pushed my embarrassment inward and worked to overcompensate to prove that I was not one of them. Still, as a child myself, I didn't want them to fear me or fear picking up the black or brown crayon in the Crayola box determined not to tarnish the pale palette of their illustrated masterpiece. I wanted to convince them and their parents that my blackness was not contagious and that the African braids that I embellished to match my attire were not a bad influence. My blackness was my superpower. I, too, had hopes and fears, good grades and age-appropriate mischief, just like them, and their children. Hmm. In this very moment, writing this, I am reminded of Malcolm X's speech, Who Taught You to Hate Yourself? His words painstakingly seduce my inner child with this bombastic tone. Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin? To such extent you bleach to get like the white man. Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? If only I could tell Mrs. R, whether it was her intention or not, that in that moment, the words that she spoke over me branded me like cattle for decades to come. As a sixth grader, I was hurled into a world of self-doubt, far from the realizations of the power of my ancestors. However, I would also like to thank Mrs. R for helping to birth an underdog persona within me that fostered my commitment to always doing my best to perform at high levels in anything that I pursued. Mrs. R's fear of my skin embedded a fear of failure within me that I still work to tame, even today. 
I am grateful for the families of people like Amber Nuzny, Becky Hill, and Shermaine Ramos, who helped to make me feel welcome in their homes during my elementary school days. I remember sitting at the dinner table with their families vividly to this day, eating the meatloaf meals from the 80s sitcoms that I so often watched. I'm grateful for the hiatus they provided from mom's peanut butter soup, but mostly grateful that they were not afraid to choose the black and brown crayons from the Crayola box in those early years. I chose to forgive Mrs. R along with the numerous other educators who, unbeknownst to them, helped to give my rose the fortitude it needed to demolish the concrete around me. The seeds of self-doubt and imposter syndrome that they planted in me at an early age were a part of my journey, but not the final chapter of my book. I also chose to forgive A.L. for raping me and shoplifting my virginity at a high school party. When I allowed A.L. to silence me that night, silence sunk into my spirit as a veil that I wore well into adulthood. After my rape, I learned to sell muted promises and hush dreams to myself, never truly liberating myself to speak my truth. My newly acquired vow of silence became a crutch whenever I was afraid that revealing a truth would hurt someone else, or even worse, afraid of the truths that would awaken the scabs of my own hurt. Take a moment and reflect on a singular truth about your past or present that you are scared to face. While this truth does not define you, it plays an important role in shaping your own story into your war cry of healing. Using your ashes to burn sage begins with facing those truths Even if they are just your truths, they matter and they deserve to be seen and heard by you and others whenever you are ready. Like a cavern that needs to be unearthed, unpacking your truth gives you the opportunity to heal the layers that make you who you are. Caverns are a natural void in the ground shaped by weathering rock. They are only as majestic as the jagged sediments that create mesmerizing formations. Your truths hang from the caverns of your soul, waiting to be discovered by tourists who seek to encounter an awakening from what lies beneath. Do the work. Welcome tourists into your caverns. Let the sediments fall where they may. Use your ashes to burn sage. It wasn't until decades later that I began to snatch my healing back from AL while on a trip to Ghana, attending a tour of the Cape Coast Castle. When you arrive at the castle, you immediately see the towering white citadel akin to an ivory chateau with palatial windows and grandiose door designs carved from the most luxurious wood etchings, juxtaposed with the cannons that line its ocean shores. Cannons that house the secrets of bloodshed, tears, and molested transgressions blasting out generations that could no longer keep the secrets due to systemic oppression and broken promises of colorblindness. You see, Cape Coast Castle is the fortress where my ancestors were chained, beaten, and treated like cattle, crowded into the tunnels of the belly of the castle as ships manned by slavers filled the shoreline with the intentions of kidnapping the culture, hopes, and bodies of my people. As the tour guide began to recall the events that actualized from those intentions, he began to describe the conditions my ancestors endured, namely elevating that slave capturers took a liking to young virgins, and oftentimes the younger African women were raped by white slavers in the cramped rooms while the shackles remained adorned on their limbs. It was there, as I walked through the bowels of Cape Coast Castle, that the memory of A.L. sprung like vomit from my belly into the ducts of my eyes and flooded the castle like a ravenous tsunami, obliterating everything in its way. Have you ever had a moment when you wept for the person you were during a life-altering event, well after morphing into an entirely different person altogether? I thought that I was no longer the young girl at the high school party, but in that moment, that girl surfaced within me. 
To other people on the tour, I'm sure they imagined my tears were solely about the conditions slaves had to endure. However, to me, my tears were for the battered wrists and ankles from the iron chains that pinned my ancestors down as they were raped, just like 15-year-old me with A.L.'s pale hands holding me down. In that moment, the spirit of my ancestors was alive in me more than ever before. It was not as if I was unaware of the fact that slaves were brutally raped by their overseers for sport. Through my own personal studies of the dynamics of slave plantations, I was keenly cognizant of the historical molestation of slaves, both female and male. However, there was something about hearing this being said while in actual slave quarters in Ghana that uncorked the bottle of tears that I had never cried about my own rape. In that very moment, wrapped in a maze of emotions, I cried for my ancestors who could not cry out as they languished on the cold concrete floors of the castle. And I cried for myself, still being held captive as an adult to false limitations that were guiding my blind pilgrimage toward increased harmony in my life. It was not until my return from the trip to Ghana that I sought out therapy to begin to unpack the bondage of my younger self. And as I began working on myself, further reflections reveal the implications of those tears in Ghana on how I show up as a leader. I began to come to terms with a new truth to the power of my potential. I was struggling from an extreme case of imposter syndrome, stemming from wanting to feel seen and heard by people like Mrs. R and AL, and most importantly, by myself. Imposter syndrome is fueled by internalized fear and a nagging spirit of inadequacy. My healing was in self-acceptance and growth, as well as in acknowledging that the fear was sashaying into my personal leadership mindsets and practices. The key to me living and leading with liberation was hinged on confronting those fears. If your fears cost you your self-worth, then they are overpriced. Be sure to order your copy of Untethered Living and Leading Liberation at edleadershipforliberation.com. That's ED Leadership, the number four, liberation.com. You can click on the book release and for liberation merchandise link and get your pre-sale order of the book today. Thank you.